What do Chairman Mao, Adolf Hitler, Klaus Schwab, and Pope Francis have in common? Springtime, a Vatican II update. This one priest serves 43 Catholic parishes in formerly Catholic Spain. And Father Finger Painter here has got himself a plan. Meanwhile, Spanish farmers physically block Agenda 2030, while Bill Gates and Pope Francis freak out over bovine flatulence. Cardinal Burke calls Catholics to urgent action, and Cardinal Sarah condemns same-sex blessings as heresy. All that and more tonight from the Remnant Underground. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Michael Matt, coming to you exclusively from remnant-tv.com because YouTube is the enemy. So make sure you hit that subscribe button down there because we need some help. We're moving off of the big tech platform. So from the you just can't make it up file, at the moment, the farmers of Europe, now get this, the farmers of Europe are doing more to stop the devil's advance across what's left of Holy Christendom than all of the feckless European bishops and Pope Francis combined. Here they are in Spain, blocking, physically blocking now, the advance of Agenda 2030. <laughs> Man, I love these farmers. By the way, speaking of farmers and Bill Gates, how do you suppose that war on beef is going? You know, there's a huge negative externality in terms of methane emission and land use that comes uh, broadly from agriculture, but from beef in, in particular. Uh, and so, you know, we've got to fund the innovation almost at an unnatural level uh, so that we take that demand signal away. What? Total nutter. And of course, Pope Francis, he agrees with Wild Bill on that imminent threat to humanity that is bovine flatulence, don't you know? He explained how urgent it is to reduce consumption not only of fossil fuels, but of many superfluous things, and said that in certain parts of the world, it would be advisable to consume less meat. Whatever. Here in the underground, you'll be happy to know we've got our own alternative food plan that we're the going to be promoting all throughout 2024. Hamburgers, sizzling beef, spicy braised beef, barbecued beef ribs, beef wellington, pepper beef, beef jerky, Beef with broccoli, beef burritos, beef fajitas, beef tacos. Do you see where I'm going with this? Beef. It's what's for dinner. Mm -mm. Makes me hungry for beef, doesn't it? There you have it. Yes, it does. You've got mail. Okay, Angie. Angie Weissner writes, Dear Mr. Matt, I'm appalled and saddened by what is going on in our beloved church. You have stated in your broadcast many times to resist. Can you give me examples of how to do that? I pray, I go to Latin Mass, but other than that, I don't know what else to do to resist. Please help. How do we resist? How do we do this? Practical applications, let's call it. But in order to even get that going, you have to once again review how serious the situation is. It's out of control now. And a great example of what it's going to look like comes to us from Germany, country of Germany, country where my grandfather was born, by the way, immigrated from Germany. Uh, Germany is a mess. The springtime of Vatican II is literally busting out all over the place. 650 Catholic churches in Germany have closed since 2005. From 2019 to 2023, an average of 28 churches were either closed or, well, in this case, repurposed and turned into climbing gyms. A half million German Catholics left the church just last year. A half million left the church. And why have they left the church? Why is there this mass hemorrhaging of Catholics from all over South America to Western Europe now, all over the world? Why is this happening? It's a new world, George. Young people are sexual at a younger age and less concerned with tradition. Now, we recognize the downside of that, but no longer believe that fear and shame are the ways to motivate people to follow the right path. But 
but uh, uh, Satan is still bad, right? <laughs> When that was made, when that Newhart bit was made, it was funny. Now I'm not even sure it's funny. I don't think anybody would get it. Does the Catholic Church still believe in the devil? Is it still a bad deal? Does he believe in sin? Do they believe in hell? I'm not sure. <laughs> so this is an old, the old Newhart bit. The reality now of what's happening all, all these years after the springtime busted out, springtime of Vatican the reality is much, much worse. This is the parish of St. Canisius in Berlin. On today's program, an unusual service. In addition to the usual praying, preaching, and singing, the pastor is blessing bicycles. He knows that the church has to come up with ways to reach parishioners if it wants to remain viable. That's why we always have some kind of special attraction in our services. An event where we try to get through to people who are otherwise unreachable to us. Why is he dressed like that? So, so the little the little finger paintings on the stole, which is the the, the sacred sign of his uh, of his authority as a priest, little finger painting. That's gonna, that's going to do what? Does does he actually imagine that's going to attract the kitties? Would a grown man actually think that? Put little hands uh, uh, on the stole, well, everybody's going to find me more. No, no, you look crazy. You look like a clown, Father. It almost seems like a parody, doesn't it? In fact, it's getting really hard to tell the difference between reality and parody in the church that Francis is building. With less and less young people coming to the church, I fear we're not going to be able to afford our zip lines anymore. The zip lines are like an integral part of the Sunday service. And we're barely making payments on the EDM prayer hall we got last year. I feel like if we don't get more people to the church, next month we're not going to be able to go to Disneyland. We're going to have to go the month after. This was the christening jacuzzi we were going to be putting in the basement of the church. And then we ran out of money. So what, we're just not supposed to have a christening jacuzzi anymore? But whether it's parody or you're looking at or not... That's why we always have some kind of special attraction in our services. An event. Um, the, the reality, obviously, is the new Mass itself just isn't cutting it anymore in the new church. By their own admission now, bishops, priests, are saying, we got to do something else. Got to bless kids in helmets. We got to get some funny stoles going. What is that saying? If you're still going to the Novus Ordo Mass, I'm not attacking you. I'm not mocking you. But we have to, as a community of believers, what's left of the Catholic Church, the believing Catholics, we've got to look at this and say, this is a crisis that comes right out of the bowels of hell. That what they're saying, this priest just said it. Got to come up with something new to try to attract. What do you mean? Worshiping God at the Mass, at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, just isn't cutting it anymore? 50 years, 60 years after Vatican II? What does that say? Right? What does that say about what's happening to the Catholic Church when they have to start inventing things and wearing clown stoles and actually putting clowns in a sanctuary to try to get people to walk into their empty churches? Well, they say it's not, you know, it's just not that. It's also the sex, the sex scandal, right? The sex scandal is a big part of this. Despite those efforts, church attendance has dropped off sharply. That's part of a broader trend in Germany. People are leaving the church in droves. Sex abuse scandals have taken a heavy toll across the country. They've trashed the liturgy. It's unrecognizable. They're, by their own admission, they've got to invent something else to try to get people to come into church. Nobody cares about their, 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 their new and reformed, uh, revised liturgy, right? They stopped teaching moral theology in the schools. Kids haven't a clue. They don't teach the rose. We don't know what's going on. They started recruiting homosexuals in the seminaries. They tore out all the divisions between laity and priesthood, right? And what do you know? There's a sex abuse crisis in the church. Wow. How did that? Who saw that coming, right? Send in the clowns. Send in the lady bishops. Never mind that even according to the World Health... Get this, this is so crucial. Don't let them get away with this. Even according to the World Health Organization, our buddies at the WHO, figures on child sexual abuse in Germany, came out of that study just recently, one million children in Germany have been sexually abused, okay, or are in the process of being sexually abused. 
Now that, according to the WHO, is one to two children in every classroom, every class in public schools. You see where I'm going with this, right? What, is it, what does that mean then? Do we need more gay teachers to stop the sexual abuse in classrooms? No. So why do we need more gay priests? Do we need more female teachers? No, that's not the problem. But in the church, we need some female priests. That'll fix the problem. Why? What's the relation here? They don't bother to explain any of that. Because what this actually means, what we're seeing with these, these staggering uh, sex abuse of kids, these staggering statistics, what it means is that the sexual revolution's roosters are finally coming home to roost, right? It means that the progressive woke society that we've, that we've built out of the ashes of Christendom is completely out of control sexually and morally, isn't it? It means the European Union, like everywhere else, is a cesspool of child abuse. Did you know that according to estimates, between 10 and 20% of children in Europe suffer sexual abuse before they turn 18? Abuse occurs mainly in their immediate environment, but the internet has added a new dimension to it. And yet the Catholic Church, and that's something, Catholic Church in Germany seems positively anxious and eager to use this massive sex abuse crisis that's going on everywhere. Protestant denominations, Jewish religion, everywhere, especially public schools. How much access do kids have to priests anymore? Not nearly as much as they have access to these perverse teachers, these perverts that somehow get over the walls in public schools, right? Or in the family, in the home, the broken home with five stepdads for every five months, five new stepdads, right? All sorts of access. Well, you don't have that kind of access in the Catholic Church anymore, but nobody pays any attention to that. Just like they're always out there making fun of the nuns and the old habits for hitting people with erasers and, 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 and rulers when there haven't been nuns dressed like that in anybody's living memory, they still are talking about the nuns beating the kids up with the rulers. It's just these little, these little myths, these black legends that they continue to propagate, right? So they're now they're using the sex abuse crisis as an excuse in the church to throw more woke ideology at the problem. Germany's Catholic Church might be on the verge of fundamental changes. Hundreds of thousands of believers are leaving. Most German Catholics think that without a radical change, their church has no future. That's why bishops, priests and church members are demanding just that from the Vatican. The so-called synodal path would like to initiate the reform of Catholicism. This is what they want. Female priests. Homosexuals within the church. Loosening celibacy rules. The church should think twice about abstinence or celibacy for priests. They demand a new outlook on sexuality. These suggestions for reform were motivated by the massive abuse seen within the church. Yeah, okay, Slick. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great idea. You might be onto something except for one little teensy weensy problem. <laughs> you see, in Germany, where you're talking here, in Germany, the thing is, the Protestant churches are having just as many problems. The Protestant churches are also hemorrhaging members all over Germany. The Protestant church is also losing members. In 2021, for the first time, less than half the population belonged to the Catholic or Protestant church. That means anyone who is Catholic or Protestant in Germany today belongs to a minority. Yeah, that's what's happening. And yet, and yet for decades now, the Protestants have already had homosexual priests. They've already had the gay little bishops. They already had the married little ministers. They already had the lady bishops. And yet, 228,000 Protestants left Germany's 20 different Christian denominations just last year. Do you see the fake and gay fake news here? Why on earth would changing the Catholic Church's rules on celibacy, women, and homosexuality, the priests or anywhere else. Why would that be in any sense a solution? Well, the short answer is it's not. It won't be. And that's not the point. They're dismantling the Catholic Church and they're using little kids who've been sexually abused as an excuse to do that. Because what else right now does the vaunted Deutsch hierarchy, what else do they propose to do? about their dying church. 
So the German synodal vague has come out today 93% in favour of blessing for same-sex couples and for civilly divorced and remarried. By March 2026, 93% of the bishops, it seems, in Germany will be offering these official blessings to same-sex couples and those who are civilly divorced and remarried. Synodal Assembly approves blessing celebrations for homosexual couples. From March 2026, there will be blessing celebrations for homosexual couples in the Catholic Church in Germany. And where did they get those ideas? Where did the German bishops get the idea that that was a good thing to do right now, to further bless sin, right? Corruption, abuse, right? Where does this come from? It came from the man in charge. It came from Francis. And everyone knows why, and everyone knows what exactly that means. The statement doesn't even specify couples who are celibate. So these are undoubtedly people who are presently engaging in what Catholic doctrine defines as sexual immorality and grave depravity. Now, if they who are sleeping together in such unions are to be blessed by the church, then certainly heterosexual couples who are sleeping together or in what the Bible says fornication must also be blessed by the church. Absolutely. Of course, that's what's going on. Of course, that's what's happening here. There's no talk about celibacy. And if you were concerned in any sense about that being an issue, make sure you're celibate, boys, and then we're going to give you blood. You would lead with that, right? Because you wouldn't want to scandal the whole world. You wouldn't want to scandalize them into thinking you were blessing people who were actively engaging in sodomy, would you? But they don't say a word. Which is why every week on this program, we bring to your attention another cardinal, another bishop, another priest who's looking at this and saying, okay, something's dead wrong. This is right out of hell. Okay, this week it's Cardinal Robert Serra who called this fiducia supplicans. He called it heresy that seriously undermines the church. He has condemned it again and again. We have another one. In other words, Francis's church, friends, not according to me, not according to rad trads, Francis's church, according to the hierarchy of the church, about half of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church has completely lost the plot. <laughs> but you don't have to be a Catholic to see it. When we look at the Catholic Church and its decline in recent years, le less young people are going, less people signing up for a religious life. And since, you could say, the 60s... Well, if it's all guitar and hippies, who the hell cares? But <laughs> since, the, since Vatican II, let's mm. say, in the 60s, the Church has been aiming to be more relevant, yeah, right. more welcoming. So it's... Yeah, been, what's the that's problem? That's not working. It's, it's not shallow, working. obviously. Shallow and contemptible. You know, it's supposed to be an invitation to the great adventure of life. What's the great adventure of life? Pick up your cross and follow me. Like, that's a hell of an invitation. But that's the invitation. And the church lost faith in that. So incredibly embarrassing. And yet so useful. Thank you, Jordan Peterson. I know this man's going to be a Catholic, and I know eventually he's going to be a traditional. If he does become a Catholic, you know he's going to be a traditional Catholic. There's no question about it. I uh, can't wait for that to happen. Uh, but what he's talking about here, obviously, is as a Catholic, looking at the Catholic Church, you say, oh, I see what's happening here. What used to be a huge citadel of moral authority to keep society running smoothly, whether you were a Catholic or not, you saw that, you noticed that. You appreciated that, that there was a moral, it's gone. It's absolutely gone. And it's been replaced by fake science, by climate change, with any other cockamamie nonsense wokeness that these guys running the Vatican decide to roll out. And it's infuriating, not just faithful Catholics, but folks on the outside who are saying, man, what happens if the Catholic Church falls completely? That's what Jordan Peterson is talking about. Why the hell do you think they're so concerned with saving the planet, which Pope Francis seems to be on about constantly when he should be saving souls. That's how you save the planet, not by worshipping Gaia. Do you think Pope Francis puts the emphasis in the wrong places sometimes? Well, I gave you that example. I don't see, for the life of me, what the Catholic Church has to do with climate crisis. Just the formulation is wrong. The priority is wrong. You save the world one person at a time. It, it lacks faith in its own mission. Francis isn't stumbling. 
He was put in there to do this, friends. And this is what I'm talking about Angie's question, practical applications. The first thing to understand, this is not happening by accident. We, as Catholics, we are under attack. We are under attack. Jordan Peterson is not a rad trad, but he can see it. Can you? So is the Catholic Church not challenging people enough Definitely now? not, not enough, not by any stretch of the imagination. The gateway to paradise is barred by the cherubs who have swords that flame and turn every which way. Well, what does that mean? It means it's hard to get into the club, man. What Francis is doing is he's engaging in a full-on revolution now. Pope Francis is getting huge welcomes in Rio de Janeiro. And now he says he's really looking for some excitement. The Pope urged young Catholics to shake up the church and make a mess in their diocese. And this is exactly what happened under Mao in communist China during the revolution. So it was young people aiming their rage at the behest in the direction of the central government of Mao mm -hmm. against not foreigners who threatened China, but against, against Chinese, against your own people. Yes. And this time, he did not use the armies. He did not have to. He had tens of millions of young people that he have indoctrinated in the government school for the past 17 years. They're ready to go. Just give them a call. Say, you are now mo uh, mobilized to defend, the, uh, to defend Mao and to defend communism. And that's what, uh, uh, the, uh, how they got the uh, kids. Now, it's very effective. Adolf Hitler did the exact same thing with what he called the Hitler Youth. Youth in Hitler's Reich. The Nazi regime monopolizes them extremely effectively. The League of German Girls and the Hitler Youth offer an attractive recreation program and a deceptive feeling of being specially chosen. Unaware, the young people are sworn to a dictator. Does that look familiar? It should. Because Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum does the same thing. He uses the exact same technique. Watch, watch how he does this here. He's telling the youth what they're thinking and what they're asking for. He's putting words in their mouth. Check it out. What should you do? Use the millennials and the generation set. What should you do differently? Most immediately, you are calling for the international community to safeguard vaccine equity to respond to COVID-19 and prevent future health crises. As disturbing as that is, when Mao does it, and when Hitler does it, and when Klaus Schwab does it, it's so much more disturbing when Francis, the Bishop of Rome, does the same thing. He wants your children to do the exact same thing. He's using them to push this revolution. Quiero agradecerles por los sueños y proyectos de bien que ustedes tienen y por el hecho de que se preocupan tanto de las relaciones humanas como del cuidado del medio ambiente. Gracias. Es una inquietud que hace bien a todos esto. Esta visión es capaz de poner en crisis al mundo de los adultos. Jordan Peterson is right. Francis has abandoned the divine mandate in favor of a globalist new religion. Pick up your cross and follow me. Like, that's a hell of an invitation. But that's the invitation. And the church lost faith in that. You think we have to be isn't... relevant. Well, what's more relevant than that? Mm. As soon as you say that you need to be more relevant than that, what you're doing, technically, is putting something else above that. Well, that's not going to work, not if the original proposition was correct. And obviously, the original proposition is correct. Now, the question is, where does this all lead? Where, where is this heading? And whether you're Catholic or not, as we say, a guy like Jordan Peterson looking at this going, what happens when the church is gone? What happens when the Catholic church is gone? What happens to all the other denom Christian denominations when the Catholic church completely goes under, completely sells out? What happens to us? Well, the result of this is what we just went over the top of the show. The Catholic church in Germany is going through what may be the most profound crisis in its history. More and more people are leaving the church. Why are so many walking away? 
So in a few years, the entire church will be Germany as the Rhine continues to flow into the Tiber, you see? So we're not just sitting here saying, we want to defend our little liturgical preferences because we like Latin. It has nothing to do with that. The Latin Mass, as far as we can tell, is the last hope of the church, right? That's where you saw the growth, the only growth in the entire church, and he's shutting it down. So in defending the Latin Mass, we're defending you too. Every faithful Catholic, whether you go to the New Mass, the Old Mass, whatever you do, we're defending you too. Because this is not going to end well for any of us. The pews are emptying everywhere. The church doors are closing everywhere. And the last generation of Catholics for whom the church means anything, certainly means enough for them to drop a few coins into the, into the basket on Sunday morning, the last generation that would do that is 80 years old now. You see? There's nobody filling the pews anymore, anywhere. And they're all going to be gone soon enough. In Europe, most of them are gone already. Teo Nieto and his handful of keys are on their way to one of the 43 churches he serves. The parish priest from Aliste in the Spanish province of Zamora drives 50,000 kilometers a year. Teo gives the church key to an elderly couple so the photographer can take his pictures. Seniors like them keep the villages alive. Many young people move away. Everything used to be more humane. Now we're alone and need help. What do you think when you see that? One priest. One priest. In Spain, Catholic Spain. And here's a question, certainly it's what I thought right away, looking at that, such as the Mass. Where do you suppose you go to confession in a spiritual wilderness like that, where you've got one priest serving 43 different churches? Talked about that before. Right now in most parishes in America, the ones that are still open, you can walk in. Saturday afternoon, there's a little green light up there, isn't there, over the box, over the confessional. And you have the peace and consolation of going to your knees and confessing your sins. How much longer is that going to last, do you suppose, with churches all over the world closing like there are one priest for 43 parishes in Spain? Friends, please think about this. While all that's happening, the Pope in Rome is shutting this down. Think about that. Just try to come up with one good reason why this guy is shutting this down. Apart from the reality, which is he is a revolutionary who's trying to destroy the church. Whether you go to the traditional Latin mass or not, whether you appreciate it or not, look at this. Why would the Pope shut down the mass of all the saints, virgins, and martyrs back to apostolic times? Why would he be doing that when the church is dying throughout the entire world? He's finishing it off. He's euthanizing the church, what's left of the church. We are not talking about theologi mere theological differences of opinion anymore. We are not talking about traditionalism versus neo-Catholicism. We are not talking about Latin versus English. You understand that, right? What we're talking about now is the hostile takeover of the Catholic Church, the end of the human element of the Church of Jesus Christ. It's going to survive, it's going to go underground, but what we're talking about is the end of the visible Church of Jesus Christ in the modern world. At a time where, <laughs> in all the annals of history, you can't find record of evil being unleashed on the world like it is right now. It's a sobering thought. And people say, what are we supposed to do? What are we going to do? You talk about it. What you... I don't know exactly what you're going to do. There are some practical points that we can consider, but it really does depend on your state in life. A priest, for example, is going to do one thing in order to survive and to help others to keep the faith in this time. A single person is going to do something completely different versus a married couple, which have a totally and entirely different set of circumstances to consider. It's very hard to give specifics. 
if it's at all possible, you do things like you move out of, the, out of the city, you move into the country, you learn to garden, you learn to hunt, learn to get off the grid, reduce your reliance on social media. All these things are sort of smaller things that we can discuss and figure out ways of doing. But the important things is to turn your home into that Catholic sanctuary. So you put, for example, an image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus on a prominent wall in your home. Where do we get this? Not from me. This is Margaret Mary Alacoque. This is what our Lord asked of all Catholics of Christendom to do, to venerate and honor the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Uh, the rosary is extremely important. We know this. Pray the rosary. But I don't mean just pray the rosary uh, every now and then. Pray the rosary as a family. Pray it aloud every night. Turn it into a ritual. You know, if you're a father of a family, mother of a family, get down on your knees, light a candle in front of a statue of Our Lady, in front of a crucifix, in the darkness of your own living room. Transform it into a ritual with your children, something that they are honored and want to do, not something that they're forced to do, or you bark at your kid, time to pray the rosary, not that. Turn it into a thing that the family does together, time to come together to pray and to acknowledge God and to worship God and to ask Our Lady to intercede on our behalf. Young people, children especially, love that sort of a ritual. Um, speaking again as a homeschool father, I would have to say that one of the most important things, when you say, what can we do if you're in a situation where you are a parent or you're going to be a parent, uh, you must homeschool now. You simply must homeschool your children, in my opinion. Uh, and if you don't have children, there are ways of supporting this front line now, the homeschool movement. There are ways to support the homeschool, support families who are doing because it, it's tough, it's difficult. There are a lot of people, a lot of friends who volunteer to tutor their friends or their family's children in the home school. There's something I really want to stress, and we're running out of time, so I'm going to make this short. And it has to do with education, and it has to do with higher education. Because there's a problem, I think, even within the traditional Catholic circles, of sort of downgrade what happened with education. First of all, it's super expensive. Secondly, it's where people or young people go to lose their faith. The college, the university system, I absolutely agree. However, God in his providence has provided alternatives now. And I want to talk about this. In fact, I want to do some shows on this. Because if we are to reclaim society for Christ the King, which we must do, whether it's the end of the world or not, we don't know. But our job is to save our own souls, save the souls of our children, and then reclaim society, proclaim the kingship of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to do that, well, we're going to need Catholic doctors. We're going to need Catholic lawyers. We're going to need Catholic nurses, Catholic teachers, right? And of course, we're going to need plumbers and pipe fitters and electricians as well. But if your children are disposed towards higher education, don't shut, the, don't shut them down. Don't shut it out because of what happened at Berkeley or at Cal State or whatever back down through the past 40, 50 years. You don't want to put them in those schools, for sure. You don't want to put your children in Ivy League schools, for example. That's where they go to lose their faith. But isn't it wonderful that in God's providence... There are small Catholic colleges and universities popping up all over the place right now, which are going to supplant the Notre Dames and the Holy Crosses of the past, right? Those places are no longer Catholic, but there are Catholic alternatives. I'll give you an example. I met my wife at Christendom College, Christendom College on Front Row in Virginia. Now, at the time when we met, this is back in 88, 89, 90, whatever it was, um, it was, Christendom was actually less traditional Catholic than it is today. It was very neo-Catholic. I'll say that in, uh, with apologies, apologies to my friends uh, from Christendom. But it was a wonderful place for us at that time. It was an oasis. It was a place where the rosary and devotion to Our Lady and the family pro-life mentality was, was prominent on campus, right? So guess what happened when I went to this Catholic college um, out of high school? My wife, myself, we became stronger traditionalists on that campus because of the really healthy, wonderful conversations that happened between us and our neo-Catholic friends, our more conservative, more centrist friends. We helped each other, I would say, in a way. My own son, Walter, here is a graduate from Franciscan University, a producer, Tess, a graduate from St. Mary's College, and both benefited from that experience a great deal. Um, my eldest daughter graduated Franciscan University. And today she's the office manager over at the Remnant newspaper. The next daughter, my daughter Alexandra, she graduated from Franciscan, from the, the, the nursing program at Franciscan University, which is top notch, one of the best reputations in the nation for nursing schools. And now she's working as a NICU nurse, you know, spending her time saving little sick preemie babies, right? Working nights, taking care of babies of some really unfortunate people. You know, it's a beautiful vocation. But she had to get that education. She had to become a Catholic nurse. 
And this for her happened at Franciscan University, despite some of the disagreements I have with Franciscan University. You know what those are. But if we had just said, oh, no evil, it's not traditional Catholic, I'm never gonna go there, we would have definitely missed out. Franciscan University, uh, Christendom College, uh, they only made, that environment only made the faith, the traditional faith in my children that much stronger. And we have these options, friends, we have to talk about that. TAC out in California, Ave Maria, Wyoming Catholic, St. Mary, all these, these places that are popping up, I truly believe in God's providence so that we can field this Catholic army, even of professionals who are gonna keep the faith and reclaim society for Christ the King. That's what we need to get back to as a community, not just as individuals, but as parents, as communities, to convey that once again. And finally, friends, put ourselves and our families and our communities under the mantle of Our Lady. Because they can never take away the rosary from us. They're taking away the mass right now, aren't they? But they can never take the rosary from us. They can never take the scapulars away from us, can they? So I want to close on that. For 33 years now, I've been leading the American pilgrims across France on the pilgrimage to Chartres. And do you know who leads us in that U.S. chapter every single year for 33 Our Lady of Guadalupe. We walk beneath the banner of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Empress of the, Americans and, of the Americas, and do you know why? Because 500 years ago, it was Our Lady who reclaimed this land from the ancient diabolical serpent, right? And she will do so again. She will drive the globalist demons out again today if we have recourse to her. So the one thing, practical uh, suggestion that I would, I would leave with you in closing, and we can all do right now, it's beautiful because it's hierarchical. We get to stand behind a cardinal of the Catholic Church who right now is providing for us an opportunity to do something extremely important together. And I want to endorse this. I want to, I want to beg you, prayerfully beg you, to do the same. Nearly 500 years ago, the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe changed the course of human history. Today, the hearts of Catholics around the world echo the same anxieties of 1531. And once again, the answer to this anxiety is not temporal, but spiritual. Now more than ever, we must fly to the protection of Our Lady for her intercession. I am therefore calling on Catholics all over the world, especially those in the Americas, to join me in returning to the loving embrace of Our Lady. This March, I am beginning a nine-month novena imploring the intercession of Our Lady of Guadalupe against the pressing crises of our age. This novena will culminate in a consecration to Our Lady of Guadalupe on her feast day in December. I ask you please to join me in this urgent return to Our Lady. We need to answer that call. We need to band together, right, with Cardinal Burke and as families, as individuals. We need to pray our beads, find the Latin Mass wherever possible. If it goes underground for a time, go underground with it because all hell on earth is happening up here. Stay Catholic. And even if it sometimes seems like we're the only one, <laughs> we'll know this, have confidence in this. We are not the only ones. People all over the world are doing exactly what we're trying to do. Keep the old faith, outlive the revolution. And even, I'll, I'll close on a little thought experiment, even if it were true, that we were the only one, that you are the only one, that I'm the only one, well, let that be a singular, the singular honor of your life. <laughs> to at the very, all the way to the end, to be among the last ones standing, friends, who can, who, who can honestly say before God in history, I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And there's nothing anyone can do to stop us, no matter what happens. We adore thee, O Christ, and we bless thee, because by thy holy cross, thou hast redeemed the world.